Welcome, welcome everybody. We will be kicking off at uh, 12 o'clock Pacific time in a couple of minutes. Thanks for joining us today. See lots of people filing in. Very exciting. Welcome everybody. We will begin in about a minute or so as people are filing in, finding their seats. Hi, Yonel from Paris. Thank you for joining us. Okay, I'm sure people will continue to file in, but it is 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, so we are going to get started. My name is Alan Barr, and on behalf of NIOSH-supported education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present another installment of the 2020 ERC ergonomics webinar series, offering free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, all participants who logged in today with their registration email will receive a link to an evaluation form that will qualify for you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Um, our next ERC webinar is going to be on July 15th, uh, same time, 12 noon Pacific Standard Time. The title of the webinar is Fatigue, Sleep, and the Consequences of Adverse Work Schedules, presented in partnership with the Southern California NIOSH ERC, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, for today, you will be muted during the presentation, but if you'd like to ask a question, and we encourage you to do so, you to do so um, please enter it into the online Q&A box, and we'll save some time at the end for um, Dr. Sterling to answer those questions for you. Today's webinar, Considerations in Exoskeleton Human Factors, brought to you by the Center for Occupational Health and Safety Engineering and COEH. Um, this talk will consider three characteristics of fit of exoskeletons, static, dynamic, and cognitive. And examples will be provided highlighting how these characteristics relate to exoskeletons. The presenter today is Dr. Leia Sterling. And Dr. Sterling is an associate professor in industrial and operations engineering at the University of Michigan, a core faculty in the Center for Ergonomics and an affiliate faculty in the Robotics Institute. She received her BS and master's in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and her PhD in 2008 in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. And it's with great pleasure that I hand the mic over to Dr. Sterling. Thank you very much for inviting me to present today. Um, there are many different human factors considerations that are relevant for designing and evaluating exoskeletons. Today, as was mentioned, I will specifically discuss the idea of fit. What does it mean to have an exoskeleton fit a person and how can we measure elements of fit? So it was requested that I provide learning objectives. And so at the completion of this activity, 
Our goals are really to be able to give examples of static, dynamic, and cognitive fit, and as well as to discuss how these fit characteristics interact. And I'll also provide examples from a few studies from my students in my research group um, that relate to these types of questions. I'd like to begin by first discussing the roles of an exoskeleton. An exoskeleton can augment capabilities. So for example, a wearer may be enabled to lift more weight or run faster or run for a longer period of time than without this system. An exoskeleton can assist the user's capability. In this scenario, the user doesn't extend capability, but offloads some of the effort required. By offloading this effort, there is a potential to reduce musculoskeletal injury risk. And an exoskeleton that can rehabilitate provides increased capability over time. It may be that a person has had an injury, a disease, or some surgery that has limited their mobility in some manner. These rehabilitative exoskeletons are used to help gain back functionality or to gain functionality that they didn't have previously. There are two primary types of exoskeletons, although some systems may have components from both categories. Exoskeletons can be passive and have supportive structure only. They can be active where motors or a form of actuation are present that can move the underlying body segment. These active systems can have controllers which define the rules for how the motors respond. These rules can be fixed, that is the rules stay the same, or these rules can be adaptive. This means the rules will change as the exoskeleton learns about the user or task. I'm only highlighting a few examples here of exoskeletons that exist. Um, for example, the levitate system shown claims to offload muscles of the shoulder, while the SUDEX system shown claims to offload muscles of the lower back. While not typically represented as an exoskeleton, spacesuits are actually a passive exosystem from a mobility perspective that provide life support. And we use these in our research as well, and I'll give some additional examples that relate to these types of passive mobility systems. Active exoskeletons can support motion of the upper or lower extremity, and here I'm showing an example of the Defy system, which adds power to the ankle during gait, the Lockheed Martin Onyx system, which adds power at the knee, and the Myomo system, which provides power to the wrist and elbow. So there's a lot of different types of systems, and they can be modular and aligned with specific joints of the body, and they can extend across multiple joints as well. So why an exoskeleton? I highlighted the roles of an exoskeleton, but, but why is there such an interest? And so I'll highlight a few different perspectives. From a military perspective, it's been shown that musculoskeletal injuries are responsible for 76% of the non-deployable military population. In Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, so these took place between about 2004 and 2007, there was a greater percentage of evacuations due to musculoskeletal injuries than to combat injuries. So for the military, the exoskeleton could passively reduce the load carried by the human muscles and can actively provide assistance to achieve a motor task. From an industry perspective, the leading causes of days away from work are due to strains, sprains, or tears, as well as soreness and pain. Here, exoskeletons may provide an opportunity to limit injury, lower loss of work, and increase return to work. For medical applications, there are a variety of opportunities. Here, I'll just highlight two. So the 2017 American Community Survey estimates about 29% of non-institutionalized adults with ambulatory disability live below the poverty line. There's opportunity that exoskeletons may support ambulation, which can make certain jobs more accessible and help support independence. There are also limitations due to insurance reimbursements for physical and occupational therapy based on the injury or disease. Exoskeletons here provide an opportunity to make at-home training realizable and potentially provide increased care that is not possible with our current insurance reimbursement policies. Exoskeleton researchers have made great strides in the mechanical designs of these systems, and there's significant current work aligned towards controllers for active exos as well. For some of these active systems. 
So to enable an exoskeleton to support a person in any of these operational environments, there must be a fluency between the human and the system. In human robotic interaction literature, fluency is the coordination between the human and the robot. If a robot takes longer than expected, the human is idle. For these robotic cases, the human and the robot are separate systems. For exoskeletons, the human and the system are connected. Motion of one requires motion of the other. If the exoskeleton takes longer than expected, the person may be fighting the system to move. So in the case of a passive exoskeleton or an active exoskeleton with a fixed set of rules, we would see adaptation of the human as they learn to use a system. In the case of an adaptive exoskeleton, we would see adaptation of both the human and the exoskeleton. So when we think about human exoskeleton fluency, it really emerges when the human and the system effectively coordinate together and co-adapt between each of them. So how we move with a system is affected by how the system is fit to the wearer. So here what I want to do is discuss three different characteristics of fit, which are unique but interact. Static fit will refer to the alignment between dimensions of the human and the exoskeleton in predefined postures. Dynamic fit refers to how the human and exoskeleton move and interact through activities. And cognitive fit refers to supporting the perception, cognition, action, decision process of the human. The user should be free to process information related to their task and environment, as well as choosing correct physical actions. So what I want to do now is actually discuss each of these fit characteristics in a bit more detail. So we'll start with static fit. So here static fit considers the anthropometric characteristics of a user, as well as the sizing of equipment components. This fit characteristic is relevant for exosystems that require kinematic alignment with user body segments to enable comfort and to prevent injury due to inappropriate forces in static postures. So the example I'm showing on the left is a pediatric device, and it was designed so that it would allow flexibility with alignment such that the motor was aligned with the carpometacarpal joint on the hand. So there were several adjustable components enabled within this design to enable that. In the middle with the Lockheed Martin Onyx system, the motor needs to align with the knee axis. And again, there's adjustment capability to allow this alignment for a particular person. With the Myomo system, the motor needs to align with the elbow axis. Misaligning and actuating component can create undesired forces and moments applied to the person. So these alignments become important. Static fit is most commonly defined through the use of anthropometric dimensions of the users. These can include linear dimensions measured through calipers or tape measures. Uh, they can also include 3D laser scan technology where information includes surface shape and contour data. Then metrics can be defined using these anthropometric measures. For example, ease is commonly defined as the space between a wearer and the equipment or system. Ease can be defined in several different ways, including a linear distance or a radial direction. So the example that I'm showing on the left is a 3D scan with a cross section that's selected and shown. A radial ease can then be defined, which is the distance between the underlying human body, so that internal circle, and the uniform in this particular case. While we can define ease in this manner, the selection of ease in one body region may affect the ease in another region based on what is adjustable in the system or the underlying fixed sizes that are available and the individual body shapes. Also, depending on the material properties of the system, too little ease in a static sense can cause difficulties in dynamic movement and dynamic fit. 3D anthropometric modeling is shown on the right for the hard upper torso of the spacesuit, provides opportunities to quantify ease and alignments for specific postures in different body sizes for a large variety of shapes. Now there are challenging questions here as well. So how much ease is too much? How tight is too tight? How does static fit affect perceived comfort and performance? These are all relevant questions that are being actively examined and pursued. Another consideration within static fit is the concept of accommodation. 
This metric can provide a pass or fail test of who can statically fit a particular system. Accommodation considers the proportion of the target population that statically fits in any size. This information can be used to create sizing systems for given equipment. Uh, designs are typically aimed to accommodate a subset of the population and exclude extreme sizes to enable to um, simplify some of these sizing schemes. When considering accommodation, it's important to take a multivariate approach. And by this, I mean that relevant measures should be considered together rather than separately. When you consider a univariate approach or one measurement at a time, you don't yield the same accommodation of the full population when multiple measures are relevant. And I want to give an example in the context of a lower extremity exoskeleton. So this table I'm showing provides some measurements uh, that would be relevant for a lower extremity system. So if we look at that first line, so we're going to include one measure at a time, just including the 90% accommodation for knee height. We start as we would want with a 90% population accommodation. But if we then consider enabling the central 90% accommodation for the calf circumference, we see the joint accommodation of both of these measures together yields an 81% accommodation for the population. As we include more measures, the total population accommodation declines. So on the left, I'm showing a figure of those first two measures, the knee height, which is on the y-axis, and the calf circumference, which is on the x-axis. The box that's shown, um, which you can see uh, over here, is from the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile for calf and fifth percentile to 95th percentile for knee. Um, so what happens is when you only consider the fifth to 95th percentile for both of these measures, you actually get a reduced accommodation. That ellipse that's being shown represents the central 90% for the two dimensions selected. So why is this decrease in population accommodation occurring? Well, someone who is 20th percentile for one measure may not and is likely not the 20th percentile for another measure. So population accommodation requires this multivariate approach to account for the variation found in human anthropometry. So when evaluating static fit, it's important to consider the relevant postures to appropriately assess ease for the desired tasks. When determining the necessary adjustability of an exoskeleton, it's important to consider a multivariate approach with different combinations of underlying anthropometric measures assessed. There's also a subjectiveness to comfort, which can lead to different desired ease across users. Each exoskeleton system will need to consider how varying ease affects their specific performance requirements. This measure of fit is important, but limited. Just because a system has good static fit does not mean the system will enable a dynamic fit throughout motions. So dynamic fit considers motion and task-specific performance. This characteristic is relevant as exoskeletons should minimize restrictions on mobility, minimize internal human system opposing forces, and enable operational tasks to be performed. When the kinematics of the human exoskeleton are misaligned, forces exerted by the operator can be countered by forces internal to that human exosystem rather than being transmitted to the environment. This inappropriate coupling can create inefficiency can increase fatigue and metabolic cost and, can, and could lead to injury. The goal is for the wearer to perform the operational tasks that they need. So on this slide, I'm highlighting functional task assessments that can be used to assess exoskeletons. For example, the Army uses representative obstacles to examine task performance for a wide variety of gear assessments. This can also be extended to, to evaluations of exoskeletons. NIST is developing an exoskeleton-specific platform that can be used in industry to evaluate tool handling, which is shown in the middle. On the right, I'm showing just a representative figure from NASA, but this is to highlight the tasks that astronauts must perform. So they typically evaluate things like kneeling, walking up and down hills, and sample collection. Functional task assessment is one method for assessing dynamic fit and can be as simple as a binary yes or no for task completion or it can be detailed. Um, for example, you can use wearable sensors to quantify characteristics of performance, 
such as coordination, agility, or balance. So in addition to functional task assessments, there are other methods that are used to evaluate dynamic fit. So one example is joint ranges of motion with and without an exosystem to show potential limitations in task performance. Shown on the right is the Mark III technology demonstration spacesuit. The green region shows the leg sweeps, uh, what the leg sweeps during nominal walking from hip flexion extension and ab adduction. When the hip bearing assembly shown is used, the region that is reachable is shown in blue. So that incomplete overlap that you see between that green and blue region is highlighting that the gait would change when wearing this system. Other occupational domains have also examined how equipment affects range of motion, for example, due to different types of protective gear. Another opportunity is to look at the relative motion between the wearer and the system to inform on misalignment of the system, which could lead to inefficiencies. Or there may be aspects of relative motion that may be purposely designed into the system to allow for accommodation. Surface pressure interactions between wearable systems and the human have also been measured and provide an opportunity to look at dynamic fit. On the right, I'm showing an example of a system developed by Dr. Anderson at CU Boulder, uh, which measures these interactions for an upper body system using surface pressures. Metabolic consumption can provide a surrogate for dynamic fit. Increased energy expenditure with a system could be interpreted as a decrease in dynamic fit. However, to understand the root causes of metabolic changes, other more direct measures of dynamic fit are necessary. Similar to static fit, there are opportunities in dynamic fit to use computational modeling to assess dynamic mobility and potential human system interactions. Methods exist to create non-deformable 3D models from laser scan data. And there's ongoing efforts in the literature to develop methods to appropriately morph those models based on underlying postures. This enables dynamic examination of body shape that can be used when designing exoskeletons or other human machine interfaces. When considering dynamic fit from an experimental perspective, it's important to consider the bias due to the subjects selected as well as the tasks that are selected. Users should be selected that are representative of the actual population expected. Similarly, tasks must be selected that are representative of the use cases. During different phases of development, these tasks may be simplified. However, with system maturity, these tasks must be appropriately expanded. From the computational approach, it's important that surface deformations are considered as shape changes during motion will affect where interactions occur. So dynamic fit provides an opportunity to consider mobility of the human with the exoskeleton, but it doesn't guarantee that the user can efficiently move. A motion that is feasible to achieve may not be natural, and delays in active support can lead to attention being focused on the act of moving rather than the operational task. So this brings the third characteristic, cognitive fit, which considers the perception, cognition, action process. This characteristic is relevant to exoskeleton fit as the operator's cognitive capability must be maintained such that operational tasks like decision-making can be adequately performed. The operator should be free to process information related to their task and related to their environment, as well as choosing appropriate physical actions to take that the exoskeleton may be supporting. So here I'm showing a simplified human information processing model that includes four phases sensory processing, perception, decision-making, and response selection. Sensation includes touch and proprioception, which is the awareness of one's body orientation and posture. Executive function combines the perception and decision-making boxes that are shown and includes cognitive functions like memory, the ability to direct attention, the ability to encourage action, and mental models, which are dynamic representations of our environment and the objects we use in our environment. Response selection includes aspects of motor selection. So our motions can be autonomous in that we don't think about the motions we perform, 
or they be, can be conscious in that we actively move our body and think about it. When you're walking down the street on a nice day, you aren't thinking about where your feet are landing. This is more of an autonomized motion. However, when you're walking outside and the sidewalk is icy, you may be directing your attention to the ground, you may inhibit certain foot placements to avoid icy patches, and you may encourage your foot to land in specific locations where you're autonomized or you're consciously thinking about your motion. So the question becomes, how does wearing an exoskeleton affect your sensation, your directed attention, or your motor selection? There are many ways in which cognitive fit can be measured depending on the pathway of interest. So I'm just gonna highlight a very, uh, a very small set of the types of tests that can be evaluated to start looking at perception. So for example, perception thresholds can be used using monofilaments of different sizes to detect when a user feels a particular force. Um, another relevant pathway is the perception of joint angles and motions. So we should consider whether an exoskeleton limits perception of relevant sensations as this could influence motor patterns. And I'll come back to this idea. Executive function includes a very broad set of measures, types, uh, measurement types and tasks. Here I'm highlighting a Simon task on that top image where a person is asked to respond to an arrow on a screen based, and based on the arrow direction, um, they, and not the location with respect to the center, they have to respond. So this simple test aligns with assessing inhibitory control. An active exoskeleton that is predicting a user's behavior may unintentionally affect the user's ability to inhibit an action that requires rapid motor adjustments. So consider this example I just gave of the person avoiding stepping on an icy patch on the ground. I may need to inhibit my nominal step to encourage stepping in a safer location. So this aspect of inhibition and selecting an appropriate task that allows you to look at inhibition uh, is a relevant thing to consider. Another example of executive function assessment is by looking at directed attention, which can be assessed using response times to cues and environments, such as this simple representation of a message light going on. Exoskeletons that use additional cognitive processing pathways may decrease attention on the environment and thus increase reaction times to additional tasks like this message light. Motor selection tests are varied based on the underlying theories that are being examined, with common measurements including, but not limited to, to motion trajectories, response times, coordination patterns, and muscle recruitments. So when considering cognitive fit, one needs to determine the relevant mechanisms to assess based on the operational environment. Directed attention and agility may be relevant for military applications, while aspects of perception and coordination may be of more importance in medical applications, just as a, a high-level example. The simplified human information processing model highlights this flow of information, but there's variation in people that may yield different mechanisms to drive their individual behavior. Another important factor is that while static and dynamic fit can be assessed at particular points in time, cognitive fit evolves as the user adapts to the system. It's also not clear why some users are adept at using systems more quickly, while others struggle to efficiently use these systems. So understanding the cognitive mechanisms that drive adaptation and adeptness is ongoing research. So these components of fit that I've presented thus far are not independent and they interact with each other. For example, modifying the static fit of a system by changing the equipment ease can affect the dynamic fit as measured through a range of motion. The spacesuit example I gave you previously is a good example of a passive exoskeleton that shows these interactions. I previously showed this image um, when we were just talking about dynamic fit. This was a planetary spacesuit and its design was not well aligned with the natural range of motion during human gait as seen by that limited overlap. So this means there's a poor dynamic fit and operators will move their legs differently when walking in the spacesuit. So what we actually see here is there's more circumduction of the hip as somebody's walking. As these motions are learned, the difficulty in moving changes the normally subconscious gait cycle to a conscious motion when they're first learning to walk in this system. 
This redirects their attention and potentially affects the operational task that they may want to perform at the same time. Although astronauts are given a lot of time to train and use and learn how to move these systems. The same issue has also been shown to occur with the shoulder design in these spacesuit systems. Astronauts will sometimes fight these systems as they get fatigued because they aren't performing the learned program motions of the suit with that onset of fatigue. So that becomes another interacting feature. For another thought example, consider an experienced welder. They use proprioceptive cues to support the performance of their precision task. With an exoskeleton, these cues would change. By offloading the muscles and tendons, there's a different feedback that would be sent. For example, the Golgi tendons are sensitive to muscle tension. So there may be a need for a welder to relearn how to perform the motor task with the same accuracy and precision using the new sensory cues that are being received. The static fit of the exoskeleton can also affect the sensory cues that are received or even the range of motion that is possible. In our remaining time, I'd like to highlight three studies that examine characteristics of fit. The first study considers how static fit affects performance. I'll highlight tactility and dexterity tasks when using a spacesuit glove. The second study considers cognitive fit and examine directed attention within this idea of executive function. And then the third study considers cognitive fit from a motor selection perspective. In that study, we examined the strategy selected when first using an exoskeleton by observing different gait characteristics. So I'll start with this first study where we were looking at the spacesuit glove. In this study, we wanted to examine um, the effect of the presence of the glove just being there, the effect of pressurizing the glove, which occurs in some situations with the suit, and the effect of static fit. And here we define static fit based on that li a linear ease, where we're looking at changing the length of the glove and how that affected aspects of their performance. Using a glove box allowed us to create a pressure differential similar to the pressurized suit. So that's what you're seeing here is that somebody is in a glove box with the, the gloves on in a specific task that we used. So we considered two different tactile tasks. One was a generalized tactility task where users touched a turntable with different sized bumps and stated a binary yes or no of whether they felt the object. We also considered an operationally relevant task. In the switchboard tactility task, the subject had to follow a prescribed order of actions across a switchboard with NASA relevant dimensions. By looking at the operationally relevant task, we incorporated additional cognitive elements that rely on tactility perception. While a subject may nominally be able to perceive objects of a certain size, as we'll see happened in this general tactility task. Use of the tactile feedback in an operational task may be degraded, which is the effect that, we're, that we saw, and I'll show you on this next slide. So on the left here, I'm showing you the results of our general tactility task. The y-axis shows the number of correct answers out of 12, so the correct answers of whether they said yes or no appropriately to those different bumps. The x-axis shows the condition. So our baseline was without the glove. We had three different glove sizes, a prescribed glove size based on their hand anthropometry, one size larger and one size smaller. And then each of these gloves was worn when pressurized, which is denoted here as a P, or unpressurized, which is denoted as a UP. In this tactility task, we did not find a significant effect of condition although we did observe that there was variation in performance for some cases. Now I'm showing the switchboard task on the right. The data supported several different findings. Here, the switchboard scores on the y-axis, and in each case, the score was lower when the glove was pressurized as to compared to when it was unpressurized. So you see that here, here's the unpressurized case and the pressurized case for the small glove. And so for each of these glove sizes, we see this decline in score when the case is, is pressurized. We also observed that there was a difference in the scoring between whether it was a large glove and whether it was this small or prescribed fit glove. So a possibility for why this may have occurred is that with the smaller gloves and that prescribed glove, the fast adapting mechanoreceptors on the fingertips that provide key sensory feedback during object manipulation 
may no longer have been transmit transmitting because they're insensitive to static forces. With the additional ease in the larger size glove, the finger had some internal motion and these mechanoreceptors were signaling the dynamic interactions. The finding that unpressurized performance increased with the larger size also actually aligns with anecdotal evidence given to us by the glove manufacturer. During the shuttle program, crew members would routinely opt for one size bigger than their prescribed fit in an effort to improve their performance during nominal unpressurized operations. So it's important to note in the shuttle program, they wear the suit for safety internal to the vehicle during launch and re-entry, and that's the, the gloves that we're evaluating here. The suit would have only been pressurized if there was an emergency. So in the study, we also examined how suit fit affects dexterity. So here I'm showing our two dexterity tasks that we used. In the U-bolt pegboard task that you see on the left, subjects reoriented U-bolts from right to left from a horizontal alignment to the vertical alignment. Subjects were asked to follow the timing of a metronome to keep a constant pace for this task. The tether task, which is shown on the right, um, so here EVA is just extravehicular activity. So this is a, a tether that's commonly used during these extravehicular activity um, tasks. So on this board, we had loops and we had a handle and the task required them to move this tether hook across a predefined order of these hooks and handles. And both of these dexterity tasks were assessed by examining completion times. So for both these dexterity tasks, we observed that the task time increased and dexter so which means dexterity decreased when the gloves were pressurized. We did not observe here an effect of size for the glove fits that we were testing in this particular study. Thus, we could increase the glove by one size to this larger size to improve tactility while not negatively affecting dexterity. Although I should note for the U-bolt task, we did have a pace that was predefined as I mentioned. So what this means is in this particular study, we did not examine the limits of dexterity, which could still be affected by the glove. Instead, we observed dexterity at a particular task relevant pacing. So this study highlighted the concept of changing static fit on task performance. The task selected also considered the interaction with cognitive fit through the definition of the tasks that were selected. This next study examined an aspect of executive function, specifically directed attention. An exoskeleton that requires focused attention can lead to limitations in performance on additional concurrent tasks. And what we had people do was we had 12 subjects go through the obstacle course shown, which has step over obstacles, inclines, declines, and cross slopes, as well as some different walking surfaces that they had to walk on. And while they were walking around this course, they had to respond to radio communications, and they had to scan for lights that were on a light array at both sides of the course. Um, and during this task, they also followed a study member at a specified pace. Subjects perform the task with the exoskeleton on, with the exoskeleton, um, with the exoskeleton on, and while it was on, they performed one condition where it was powered. So by powered, I mean that the, the motors were active. And then they also did this with the exoskeleton on, but unpowered. So that means that the um, motors were not active, as well as a third condition where the exoskeleton was off. So by off, I mean that they weren't actually wearing it. Each condition that they went through of, of these three conditions lasted about one hour and occurred across different days. And then after each condition, subjects completed a NASA TLX to obtain perceived workload feedback. So on the left, I'm showing you a plot that has the visual reaction times. Um, so the visual reaction times are on the Y axis and the X axis shows you the 12 subjects and then the different shading shows you the condition of the exoskeleton. Now, just by seeing this plot, we can clearly observe variability between subjects. We also observed that for several subjects, the exoskeleton did indeed affect visual reaction time, although this was not observed in all subjects. Now, this image I'm showing on the right uh, are the results of our NASA TLX evaluation. So here we observed that the exoskeleton was perceived to increase mental workload, physical workload, effort, and frustration. While not all subjects showed an increase in visual reaction time, all subjects had a perceived increase in overall workload. 
So these findings are important as perceptions can drive our human motor strategies, they can affect our mental models, and they can affect our usage of the system. So it's important to consider um, also for this study that this was early adaptation to using an exoskeleton and cognitive fit can change over time. So these results may change as users become more experienced with exoskeletons. So just to highlight, um, yeah, so while not all subjects had a measurable difference, um, that perception was increased. In this final study that I'll share, we used an ankle exoskeleton that supports push off during walking. The study was performed at the MIT Lincoln Lab Strive Center, which is the image shown on the right. Here we captured the initial experience with walking with this exoskeleton. And we considered how gait characteristics change with exoskeleton usage, specifically stride length and stride width. These characteristics can provide insight into the strategies and goals a person may have either consciously or unconsciously selected. This plot shows represented data from our task timeline. The x-axis is the number of strides, and the blue line on the graph shows the treadmill speed while the black line highlights the normalized stride length for a single subject. When we were examining the gait characteristics, we considered several phases within the collected data. We considered a baseline performance where the exoskeleton was on but unpowered. And then that A region is where the exoskeleton was powered and actively assisting the subjects. And then the D region was where the exoskeleton was still um, on but unpowered. So the plot that I'm showing you on the right has each subject as a different color. The y-axis is the change in normalized stride lengths between two phases of the trial. And then those different regions are differences between those phases. So a bar above zero indicates an increase in stride length, whereas a bar below zero indicates a decrease in stride length. We found a significant interaction between subject and condition. So we examined each subject separately to understand this individualized behavior. By understanding how an individual uses a system, we can determine where there are opportunities for improved design or training. We observed that when the system was first turned on, that subjects would increase, maintain, and decrease stride length. We can see this by looking at the A1 minus B3 region. Increasing step length is aligned with additional power being added to the step by the ankle actuation. However, decreasing stride length provides a way to increase anteroposterior stability. So that's the forward-backward stability direction. So people initially selected different strategies when using the system. Region A3 minus A1 describes the period with the system powered. So as users were adapting to the exoskeleton, we observed that many subjects increased their stride length, also though some subjects maintain their stride length. When the system was powered, was uh, turned off, subjects again varied their responses as seen by the D1 minus A3 region of the plot. Interestingly, some people further increased their stride lengths when the power was turned off. We also considered the changes in the normalized stride width. Increasing stride width is aligned with increased lateral stability. Several subjects increased their base of support when the exoskeleton became active. As the subjects adapted to the exoskeleton, most subjects reduced their base of support as seen in that A3 minus A1 region of the plot. In this study, we did not provide specific instructions to the subjects on how to use the system. Without specific instructions, varying strategy selection was observed. Some of the observed changes may have occurred from increased caution when using the system, either consciously or unconsciously. Future opportunities exist to create explicit instructions that can guide strategy. For example, you may want to encourage stability at the beginning and then transition to providing strategies that reduce energy costs for optimal usage of the system when it's being used operationally. In describing static fit, I presented the idea of a multivariate analysis for population accommodation. For cognitive fit from a motor selection perspective, we need to define what is a good behavior for an exoskeleton for a specific task. We observe step length changes when the exo was powered on in our ankle exoskeleton study. We need to consider what we mean by good performance. 
it isn't necessarily bad that a different strategy is selected when the exoskeleton is powered on. However, we need to understand the goals of the system. Are there behaviors we're trying to encourage? Are there tasks in the environment on which performance needs to be maintained? We're used to considering human studies where we use the subject data to estimate means and then look at differences in means. However, we're designing exoskeletons for the individual, not the mean. We don't have everyone wear a size medium shirt, and similarly, we need to determine the parameters for exoskeleton controllers and training to achieve the desired behavior for an individual. It is also important to consider that people naturally have different underlying behaviors, and these need to be considered. So in today's talk, I highlighted three characteristics of fit. I also highlighted a subset of tasks and measures that can be used to quantify these characteristics. I do want to take a moment to recognize the efforts by the ASTM F48 committee. They're putting together many documents that will support exoskeleton assessment, including more comprehensive sets of relevant tasks for different types of operational environments. Changes in motor strategy may arise from static or dynamic fit of the exoskeleton, but can also arise due to cognitive fit. And then finally, I just wanna emphasize the importance of the users that are studied and the variability in both physical and cognitive metrics that are present. A design and evaluation approach that considers the diversity among us will benefit these efforts. So I would also like to acknowledge the students who performed the research that I highlighted today as well as the other collaborators we've had on these different projects. The efforts that I showed you were supported by the NSF, the US Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Soldier Center, MIT Lincoln Laboratories, and Draper. For more information on static, dynamic, and cognitive fit, um, a lot of the material I presented today came from an article that we recently published, and I'd also encourage people to uh, look into more details there as I wasn't able to describe everything to you in today's uh, discussion. So at this point, I'd love to open up to Q&A and, and questions. Okay, thank you very much, Leah. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I don't, uh, my wife tells me that my young scientists at home did not make it all the way to the end, but they particularly loved the pictures of the astronaut. Just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> Um, we have an, a very large uh, group of attendees today, so I'm expecting a few questions to roll in. Um, we do have um, a couple, and I also have one. I think I'll kick it off, if you don't mind. Um, so from your perspective, um, well, what you presented today seemed largely to inform the design um, of exoskeletons, and I'm wondering which characteristics of fit would you consider to be the most important when choosing an, an existing exoskeleton for a particular task or set of tasks? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that is a really important question. So I think one of the things that we need to better understand are what are the, the tasks and goals of the exoskeleton? So as I showed, there's a lot of different types of exoskeletons and they can be designed to support different parts of the body. So it's important to understand what risks you're trying to limit or what um, activities you're trying to support. And so by better understanding kind of more of a task analysis approach, you can start to say, well, these are the muscles that I'd like to alleviate, or this is the capability I'd like to enhance. And so by understanding the relevant operational tasks, you can start to select the exoskeletons that would be exoskeleton or set of exoskeletons that may be appropriate. So for example, you may want to offload a person, but you may also want to support an action. So it may be that there is an exoskeleton that relieves um, load off of um, the shoulders or the back, but also a, an active exoskeleton component um, that supports some type of action. So I think task analysis becomes really important to understand the needs of the system. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions, and uh, I'll start with 
Um, are exoskeletons ever used by surgeons in the operating room to help alleviate long static postures or, or limb holding? And if so, uh, what are the findings and where can one find out more about the application of exoskeletons in the medical industry? Oh, this is a really great question. Um, there are researchers that are looking at using exoskeletons in a clinical environment. And I don't want to provide references just uh, straight off the top of my head because I don't think that would do justice to the researchers that are working in this domain. I myself have not done exoskeleton research looking at relieving um, some of the surgical loads, but there are researchers that are out there and I'm sure we can kind of pull together some sources and provide some additional uh, information on these different efforts. Um, but I, I do think that there's lots of opportunities to support reducing fatigue during, during surgery. Thank you. Um, next question. Do we have an optimal balance between these three fit characteristics? So that's an intriguing question as well. So I don't think, so the, the term optimal implies that there's some objective function that is being, you know, maximized or some features that might be minimized, right? And so what you find important and what you might want to maximize may be dependent on the operational environment and the operational task. So this is actually a question that I'm really intrigued in myself of in different types of environments, in different types of tasks, what is uh, the important features that, that um, are being weighted and how do those weightings change based on the environment that you're in? So I would say that there is not one set of, you know, optimal weightings across these three characteristics. And based on the task that you have, there may be certain features that are prioritized. Thank you. Um, someone's curious about insurance premiums and will they decrease with the using of such devices? Oh, I wish I had an answer to that. I, I don't know. I think this is actually really an open question um, from a logistics perspective of just with the addition of these systems, how does that affect insurance reimbursements? How does it affect clinical time? And how does, um, how, do, how do clinicians interact now if people are using these systems at home um, as well and, and how much interaction they have? So I think there's a lot of questions that still need to be addressed from more of that logistics perspective from the insurance side. So I can't comment on how that might increase or decrease costs, but I think the hope is that it would provide increased interaction for the user um, and hopefully at a, at a decreased cost. Yeah, that was a tough one. Um, a, viewer would a viewer would like to know what is the most important fit characteristic when considering medical rehabilitation? Yeah. So for medical rehabilitation, again, I, I can't explicitly say what is most important. I think there's an aspect of the cognitive fit pipeline of that information processing pipeline that you really want to encourage because it may be that there's aspects of um, perception or motor control that have changed. So for that particular person, you want to be able to encourage, encourage specific actions. But, but with that said, you still need to have an appropriate static and dynamic fit because if you're encouraged, trying to encourage particular actions, um, but that system is not well aligned for the type of tasks that they're performing, then you may not be able to encourage what you want to be encouraging. So it may be that you want to emphasize aspects of cognitive fit while you're using the system and working with the person, but you're reliant on already having a good uh, dynamic fit uh, to implement that, that next stage. I, I think they're, while these all interact, they, they necessarily have almost a level to them, right? So really to work on the aspects of cognitive fit, you should at least have a dynamic fit and a static fit. And similarly, to have a dynamic fit, um, you need to start off with at least having a static fit. So they, they build on each other. Thank you. Um, there's a question about existing exos and the percentage of the population that they uh, currently fit statically um, from a multivariate perspective. And do you have an estimate on what um, that percentage might be? And how far do designers need to go to truly accommodate 90 to 95% of the working population? 
Um, another great question. So I don't know how much of the population that exoskeletons currently accommodate um, because I haven't looked into just the dimensions and adjustability of each different exoskeleton manufacturer. So I think that this is an area where it's important for the uh, people developing exoskeletons to actually think about that. And when they're talking about their system um, at a later stage where it's more commercialized of being able to provide that information of what percentage of the population they accommodate. And if they don't accommodate people, um, why they don't accommodate people um, or, and who they don't accommodate. Because if we're starting to think about using exoskeletons as protective equipment uh, in industry perspectives, then you need to be able to accommodate your workers. And so I think it brings up some really you know, important questions of how we're designing these systems and doing protective gear and whether you know, a person can now have any job or whether they're limited to the job that they can have at a specific industry line, for example, based on the type of exoskeletons that are available. So I think that that, that question is an excellent question and it really brings up more operational questions of how these exoskeletons might get integrated into particular environments based on what an individual exoskeleton can accommodate. Uh, thank you. Um, still have plenty. We have some time and we have more questions. Um, if I'm not getting to your question, you may have put it into the chat window. I am focusing on the Q&A box. There's another window that you can use to submit questions. So I apologize if you, if I don't get to your question. We do have a lot of questions now and they, uh, I'm focused on the Q&A box. Um, let me see. Um, I think you've already answered that. Um, which of the fit factors has been most challenging for military applications and what are some ongoing strategies to overcome those challenges? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so from that one, I'm thinking about it from this perspective of something that I, I didn't actually touch on as much in this talk, but is related to this element of cognitive fit. So I talked about how there are active um, exoskeletons and how they can have different types of underlying controllers. And those controllers may need to have a different behavior based on what the person is doing. So for example, if the person is, you know, climbing over a wall or climbing through a window versus, you know, they're trying to be agile and run around, um, you know, certain obstacles that are, that are in their way or, you know, a variety of different tasks that they're doing it may be that the exoskeleton needs to have a different controller to achieve that particular task. So what that means is that the exoskeleton has to transition from one mode to another mode. And even if that transition, if that mode is continuous and the exoskeleton is kind of smart and able to do that transition, there is an underlying different behavior. So that underlying different behavior means that the user has to understand and trust that the system will support them with the right type of action at the right time for the right task. And so there's an element of the person um, knowing that the system will respond to them and the system actually being able to be in that right mode. So I think there's an aspect in this area of cognitive fit of the mental models that are being built and then developing trust in the, in the system at a, at a calibrated level, right? They trust the system appropriately with tasks that the system was designed to do. And so I think that's gonna be one of the big questions going forward with these active systems is if you want the system to do more than just one thing and support more than just one environment, how do you enable that fluency between the human and the system a way where um, they're using it effectively and the system and human trust each other. Thank you. Uh, do you have any insight on the time to cognitively adapt to the exoskeleton and also how quickly that adaptation might degrade if the person stops using it, going on vacation or out for whatever reason, coming back to work? So I think this is a newer area of, of research, and I think that there's been some exciting research out of um, Dan Ferris's group and Steve Collins' group that have looked at some of these adaptation timelines for very specific um, exoskeletons. 
We've also looked at it in our group for some certain exoskeletons. And it, you know, it, it really depends. Some people are, with the exoskeletons that we've tested, um, adapt really quickly um, on the order of, you know, steps or minutes. And there's other people that, you know, at the end of the second day are still adapting and still changing. So I think there's a really interesting question to be asked about, um, you know, what is driving aspects of some people to be more adept and other people to be less adept? And how can we maybe modify training or modify controllers in order to help decrease that, that training timeline? And then the, the question of um, uh, when you take it off for a long period of time and then put it back on, I think you know, that's something that definitely needs to be explored in more detail. And I would say that this, the, uh, what I know now is, is probably just more anecdotal from researchers putting the system on. And I, I don't know that I'm aware of a study that has really looked at these longitudinal long-term changes. Okay, thank you. There are a number of remaining questions that are left unanswered. I would encourage you to reach out to Dr. Sterling um, if you would like those questions answered, and I apologize for not getting to your question. Um, this was a very well attended talk, and there were a tremendous number of questions. Um, so my apologies for not getting through all of those. Um, I would like to thank the presenter and everyone um, who joined us for today's webinar. You can learn more and register for upcoming webinars at coeh.berkeley.edu. And as a reminder, the all participants who logged in today with their registration email will receive a link to an evaluation form. And that evaluation form will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Dr. Sterling, I want to thank you so much for an excellent talk and thank you everybody for attending today. And that uh, will end our seminar. Thank you. Thank you.